You mentioned smart contracts. What are your thoughts about, in the context of the history of money, about Ethereum, about smart contracts, about kind of uh, more systematic at, at scale formalization of agreements between humans? I think it must be the case that a lot of the complexity in a mortgage is redundant. That when we are confronted with pages and pages and pages and pages of small print, uh, we're seeing some manifestation of, of the late stage regulatory state. The transaction itself is quite simple. And most of the verbiage is just ass covering by regulators. So I think the smart contract, although I'm sure lawyers will email me and tell me I'm wrong, can deal with a lot of the plain vanilla and maybe not so plain transactions that we want to do and eliminate yet more intermediaries. That's my my kind of working assumption. And given that a lot of of financial transactions have the potential at least to be to be simplified automated turned into smart contracts that that's probably where the future goes i can't see an obvious reason why my range of different financial needs let's think about insurance for example mm -hmm. will continue to be met with instruments that in some ways are a hundred years old. So I think we're still at an early stage of a financial revolution that will greatly streamline how we take care of all those financial needs that we have, uh, mortgages and insurance leap, leap to mind. You know, most households are, are penalized for being financially poorly educated and confronted with oligopolistic financial services providers. So you kind of leave college already in debt. So you start uh, in debt servitude. And then you got to somehow lever up to buy a, a home if you can, because everybody's kind of telling you you should do that. So, so you and your spouse, you are getting even more leveraged and you're your long one asset class called real estate, which is super illiquid. Mm -hmm. I mean, already I'm I'm crying inside at the thought of describing so many households' financial predicament in that way. And I'm not done with them yet because, oh, by the way, there's all this insurance you have to take out. And here are the providers that are willing to insure you. And here are the premiums you're going to be paying, which are kind of presented to you. That's your that's your car insurance, that's your home insurance. And if you're here, it's the earthquake insurance. And Pretty soon, you're just bleeding money in a bun bunch of monthly payments to the mortgage lender, to the insurer, to all the other people that lent you money. And let's look at your balance sheet. It sucks. You know, there's this great big chunk of real estate. And what else have you really got on there? And the other side is a bunch of debt, which is probably paying too high interest. The typical household in the median kind of range is is at the mercy of oligopolistic financial services providers, go down further in the social scale and people are outside the financial system altogether. And those poor folks have to rely on banknotes and informal lending with huge punitive rates. We have to do better than this. This has to be, this has to be improved upon. And I think what's exciting about our time is that technology now exists that didn't exist when I wrote The Ascent of Money to solve these problems. When I wrote The Ascent of Money, which was in 2008, you couldn't really solve the problem I've just described. Certainly, you couldn't solve it with something like microfinance. That was obviously not viable. The, the interest rates were high. The transaction costs were crazy. But now we have solutions, and the solutions are extremely exciting. So fintech is this great force for good that brings people into the financial system and reduces transaction costs. Crypto is part of it, but it's, it's just part of it. There's a much broader story of fintech going on here where you get, suddenly you get financial services on your phone don't cost nearly as much as they, they did when there had to be a bricks and mortar building on Main Street that you kind of went humbly and beseeched to lend you money. I'm excited about that because it seems to me very socially transformative. I'll give you one other example of what's great. 
the people who really get scalped in our financial system are senders and receivers of uh, remittances, which are often amongst the poorest families in the world. The people who are like my wife's family in East Africa, really kind of hand to mouth. And if you send money to East Africa or the Philippines or Central America, it's it's te- the transaction costs are awful. Uh, I'm talking to you, Western Union. <laughs> We're going to solve that problem. So 10 years from now, the transaction costs will just be negligible and the money will go to the people who need it rather than to rent-seeking financial institutions. So I'm on the side of the revolution with this because – I think the incumbent financial institutions globally are doing a pretty terrible job and uh, middle class and lower class families lose out. And thankfully, technology technology allows us to fix this. Yeah, so fintech can remove a lot of inefficiencies in the system. I'm super excited myself, maybe as a machine learning person in uh, data oracles. So converting a lot of our physical world into data so and have smart contracts on top of that. So that no longer is there's this fuzziness about what is the concrete nature of the agreements. You can tie your agreement to weather. You can tie your agreement to uh, the behavior of, sever- of certain kinds of financial uh, systems. You can tie your behavior to, I don't know, uh, I mean, all kinds of things. You can connect it to the body in terms of human um, sensory information. Like uh, you can make an agreement that if you, don't lose five pounds in the next month, you're going to pay me a thousand dollars or something like that. I don't know. It's a stupid example, but it's not because like you can create all kinds of services on top of that. You can cre- you can just create all kinds of interesting applications that completely revolutionize how humans transact. I think, of course, we don't want to create a world of Chinese style social credit in which our behavior becomes so transparent uh, to providers of financial services, particularly insurers, that uh, when I try to go into the pub, I'm I'm stopped from doing so. <laughs> Every time you uh, take a drink, your insurance goes up. <laughs> <laughs> right, or, or my credit card won't work yeah. uh, in certain restaurants because they serve, you know, ribeye steak. I fear that world because I see it being built in China. Yeah. And we we must, at all costs, make sure that the Western world has something distinctive to offer. Uh, it can't just be, oh, it's the same as in China, only the data go to to five tech companies rather than to, to, to Xi Jinping. So I think the, the, the way we need to steer this world is in the way that our data are by default vaulted on our devices and we choose when to release the data yes rather than the default setting being that the data are available that's important i think because it was one of the biggest mistakes of the evolution of the internet that that in a way the default was to let our our data be plundered it's hard to undo that but i think we can we can at least uh, create a new regime that in future makes privacy default rather than open access default. 